Um, so our next session, we're going to talk about ground uh, and work through some examples on that. Um, and I'm going to turn over the podium for this session to Vikram Srikanti, who's the graduate student who's been leading the effort here, along with Rolando Garcia. Um, and both uh, Vikram and Rolando and a bunch of other folks from the RISE Lab team will be here through the exercises uh, that follow. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Can everyone hear me? I'll take that as a yes. Uh, great, thank you. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Vikram Srikanti. I'm a second year PhD student working with Joe. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit today about a system called Ground, which is a data context service. But before I start telling you exactly what I mean by that, I'd like to take a second and, and reflect on all the systems that we've um, talked about so far during RISE Camp. So first, you guys learned about Ray, which is a distributed Python execution framework that's oriented towards developing AI applications. And then we talked a little bit about Clipper, which is a low latency prediction serving system. And this morning, Eric told you guys about Pyren, which allows you to automatically parallelize data analytics using AWS Lambda. And throughout these, uh, throughout these first three systems that we've talked about, there are some themes that, that we've picked out. The first is improved programmability. Both Ray and Pyren have a focus on providing simple frameworks that allow you, uh, as the end user, to be able to program without being you know, a computer science PhD student working in the RIAS lab. And so it's very straightforward and very accessible um, for the end user. The second theme is new modes of operationalization. So both Ray and Pyren, and especially Clipper, focus on making it really easy to deploy your code and your application which mean that you don't have to you know, think about spinning up servers or starting new Docker containers. All those things are abstracted away for you. And lastly, the, the third key theme is that all these systems are data-centric and data-rich. Data is a first-class citizen in, in Ray and Pyren and Clipper, and all these systems both take in a lot of data and generate a lot of data as output. And so the implications of these themes are first that if we have improved programmability, that means that more people are able to program in these systems more easily, which means that more, there are going to be more developers and there are going to be more applications built by those developers. And as a result, we're going to have more breadth and more depth of applications. New modes of operationalization means that we're going to have more deployments. More people are going to be using these systems to build applications and they're going to be able to deploy them really easily, which means that we're going to have more complex environments, whether it's Lambda or other AWS services or other cloud providers, or even running things on-prem, you're just going to have a much, many more degrees of freedom when you're thinking about deploying these applications. And lastly, there, we're going to just have a lot more data, and more applications are going to depend on more kinds of data, and de those dependencies are going to become significantly more complex. So you're probably thinking, this sounds pretty great, the world is in a great state, and we're moving towards easier programs, more people can program, everything's going really well, but then I wouldn't be giving this talk. So clearly, there's something that's missing. And what's missing is holistically capturing the context around more. In particular, we think that you need to understand not just data, but code and training and testing of applications and building the pipelines that actually run those applications and capturing usage around who in your organization is doing what with that data and revisions of code and so on and so forth. I could probably keep talking for the next 20 minutes just on things that are important for us to capture in, in the context of these applications. Currently, the open source state of play is the Hive Metastore. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. But the Hive Metastore really only captures one small aspect of this context, and that's a part of the data. It allows you to capture metadata around your relational deployments. But it, everything else on that list and everything else that you guys can probably think of, you probably have more examples than I do, don't fit into the Hive Metastore, right? And so there's a clearly a, a very big missing component here. Once we start thinking about capturing this context, we want to think about how we manage and how we exploit or learn from the digital exhaust of this activity. And once we have captured it, we want to think about how and when and what we learn from that usage information. This is what we're calling data context. Data context is all the information surrounding the use of data in an organization. But even that definition is pretty vague, so I'm going to drill down a little bit more and, and get a little bit more specific. And in particular, we have three different kinds of data context that we care about. We call them the ABCs of data context. The first is the application context, which describes how raw bits are interpreted for use in an application. This encompasses what you might traditionally think of as metadata. These are 
mo uh, models, like statistical models or semantic models, um, code, actual application. And all, all these things come under the application context. The simple example uh, might be database schemas. A more complicated example might be capturing um, the data and the code that actually combine to run a machine learn, uh, generate a machine learning model and um, the model that actually makes predictions, all those things come under the application context. And we're actually gonna see an example of that later today in, the, um, in one of the tutorial exercises. The second kind of data context is the behavioral context. And this is information about how data was created and used by real people and systems. And so this is where we start getting into what I was talking about a second ago. When we have more people touching data, and more people generating new data and building applications that depend on data, sometimes, for regulatory reasons, sometimes just in order to, to capture what people refer to as tribal knowledge, we want to be able to understand who's touching data, what they're doing with it, where in, or in what environment they're running that data, what code is actually being run on what data, and, and all these kinds of things, right? So this is captured by what we call the behavioral context. Um, as an example here, uh, one, one particular use case is, is scientific reproducibility. So an example that we've, we've sort of been giving since the, the beginning of this project is thinking about how you can actually um, say, hey, I ran some experiments, I wrote a paper, and then you know, I got a reviewer who said, I don't believe your results. And we wanna go back and be able to say, okay, you know, on September 8th, I ran this code on this version of the data. Here was the data set that I downloaded from you know, some website. Um, here was the environment that I ran it in. Here were the, the Python dependencies of the actual versions that were running in the Conda environment that I ran my code in. Th th there's a very large number of things that you actually have to care about in order to um, be able to reproduce uh, an experiment. And these are the kinds of things that, that motivate our definition of the behavioral context. The last kind of data context is change over time. And this is really capturing the version histories of the other two kinds of data context. And what, well, the reason this is important is because we don't think it's just valuable to understand what the world looks like today. That's useful, but we also wanna know what the world looked like yesterday, or six months ago, or a year ago, and also help users understand how things have evolved over time. So it's not just today, it's not just a year ago, but it's also change over time and that, that evolution process that we think really helps users unlock the, the value of data context um, in, in an organization. So ground is the system that we have been working on for, for two years now that, that actually helps you capture your data context um, and, and hopefully learn from it. Um, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the underlying design principles that have motivated our work, and then we'll talk a little bit about the system. So the first, the first design principle is uh, model agnosticism. And what we mean by that is sort of to my point a minute ago about Hive Metastore, there, you know, 20 years ago, everyone was just using relational data. Today we have relational and JSON and YAML and Parquet and Avro and, and, and a ton of other data formats. And there's probably gonna be new ones by the time I finish this talk, right? So it's really important to be able to capture not just the existing kinds of data context or application context, but be flexible enough to be able to capture whatever pops up in the future so that the, the usefulness of the system outlasts any particular data format and any particular data storage system that, that a user might be using. The second is this concept of immut immutability, which relates to, to our idea of change over time. So we really think that it's important to make sure that you are capturing your data context without overriding history and being able to you know, tie into this idea of evolution and looking into the past and understanding what the past looked like and how things have changed. The third design principle is scalability. And this comes from this idea that a lot of times this, this behavioral context, this usage information that we're thinking about comes from usage laws. And as everyone knows, logs can get really big, really, really fast. So it's really important that we're designing things that can scale from the beginning that allow people to capture massive amounts of data context um, in ground. And the last is open community. We think it's really important that ground is a community effort that we um, you know, get use cases and input and feedback and hopefully even code from, from folks in industry, from folks in the community who are interested and excited about this stuff. So, so that's how we've sort of been when thinking about ground as, we, as we've been building it. But now I'm gonna dive into the system a little bit more. At the core of our work is this thing called common ground, which is a data model, a meta model, and a set of underground APIs to services that ground depends on, and a set of above ground APIs to applications that are actually gonna be interacting with ground and benefiting from the data context stored in ground. First, we're gonna dive into the meta model, and then we'll get to the, the other stuff. 
this is, this is our full meta model. And we're going to go from the, from the bottom up and, and sort of look at each one of these layers separately. And the nice thing here is that each one of these layers corresponds to one of the ABCs of data context. So the bottom modeling graph corresponds to the application context. The, the version graph in the middle co corresponds to change over time. And the, line or the lineage or usage graph at the top corresponds to the behavioral context. The model graph is very simply nodes and edges. Um, we think that this is, like we said, we want to be model agnostic, and we think this is the best way to be model agnostic. Graphs are very general, very powerful data structures. They can represent basically anything. As an example, on the left here, we have a relational schema. Um, that the schema has some tables, the, the tables have some columns, and things like foreign key constraints are represented as edges. On the right, there's a JSON document format, which is a little bit more unstructured. You can add things to a JSON document um, that may not be in another version of that same document. And so we can see here that there are two objects, and they're pretty easily represented, again, in a graph structure um, without you know, much mental acrobatics. So that's the, that's the application context, the model graph layer. Diving in a little deeper, all of these objects, both nodes and edges, are versioned over time. So you can understand not just what the world looks like today, but what it looked like in the past. So every node is versioned, and every edge is also actually versioned, which allows you to capture relations between different versions of data, as well as relationships between you know, cross-sections of time. Our versioning model is a directed acyclic graph, or DAG model, um, which warrants highlighting, because it allows you to do this nice thing where, as you can see at the very top, the two thing, the, the, the two commits, uh, these, these are git commits, the two commits at the top um, clearly came in order, the second one came after the first, and the two commits at the, the third layer came in no particular order. Based on this, this DAG, we can't say whether the one on the left happened before the one on the right, or vice versa. And, and this, this DAG model is at the core of how we deal with versions of the ground. The last part of the, of the data model is the, the lineage layer. And the reason that, that this is a separate layer that we've, that we've um, separated it from the rest of the data model is because we think treating lineage or provenance as a first class citizen in ground is really, really valuable. And in terms of the data model, the, the tangible application of that is that regular edges in the, in the application modeling layer can only point from one node to another node as you know, most graphs work. But the key thing here is that these lineage edges can point to both nodes and edges or to other lineage edges. And the reason for that is you can imagine, let's say that you had a recommender system that was a node, and that recommender system made a prediction, and that prediction was logged in ground. And um, that the prediction that it made was that there's a user and there's a TV show or a movie, let's say, and there's an affinity relationship between the user and the TV show. Um, so you come back a week later, and a customer comes and says, hey, why did you recommend that TV show to me? I thought that that was a terrible TV show. I'd never like that. You want to go debug, hey, why did this happen? Why do we make this bad prediction? Well, if you want to be able to say this is the version of the model that actually made that prediction, that made that edge, that, that created that affinity relationship, then that's, you're going to need a lineage edge that actually points to that edge. So lineage edges are first class citizens. They have, the semantics are a little bit different. Um, but they really, this is how we represent this usage, this behavioral context layer in graph. So that's kind of the whole thing. This is, this is our data model. We've tried to keep it simple. We've tried to keep it very general. Um, but we think it's really powerful because it allows you to represent uh, a number of different things in a very, like we said, model agnostic way. So that's the core, that's the meta model, it's what we spent you know, a lot of time working on. Um, but there's a lot more to, to the way we view the world. Um, underground, like I mentioned, are services that, that ground depends on. So these are things that, that ground needs to be functional, effective data context services. In particular, um, we care about crawling and ingestion. So how do we find new uh, logical objects? How do we ingest them into ground? How do we know that things have changed? How do we keep ground really up to date? ID and authorization is another big one. Um, this is something that you know, we don't have a lot of experience with in academia, but we, we understand that it's really important that um, things like governance, uh, those sorts of use cases really will benefit and require having ID and authorization. The third is version storage. Um, right now, we're depending on things like Git and building a you know, versioned ORM around Postgres in order to um, support versioning natively in ground. Uh, but this is something that, that we think is an active um, research area that I'll talk more about in a second. And the last is search and query. So every object in ground can have unstructured tags. 
So how do we help users efficiently retrieve those tags and uh, make sense of the make sense of the context that's in ground um, without having to you know look at the whole world? Above ground are a bunch of applications, and, and this list is by no means prescriptive or exhaustive. But these are a bunch of applications that we think are interesting and exciting in terms of applications that will benefit from having ground to learn from and to uh, to read data context from. Um, and we have a couple focuses here that I'll, that I'll talk more about in a second. The version storage stuff we think is really interesting underground from a research perspective because we want to dive a little bit more into how we build you know, natively versioned graph systems. Um, we've, like I said, experimented with a bunch of databases. Right now we're using Postgres, we've used Cassandra and Neo4j um, and some other databases underground. And we are, our, our hunch, our, our intuition is that none of these systems are going to be particularly performant at scale for some of the, the graph-based workloads that we're thinking about based on our data model. Um, so that's something that we're interested in, in diving into a little bit more. Above ground, um, we're really interested in thinking about uh, AI pipeline management. So we're working with the Clipper team to think about how you um, define your pipeline for your AI applications and focus on you know, tool like bringing software engineering best practices into um, into the AI development space. So things like continuous integration, continuous deployment. What what are the analogs of those things from the software world in the AI world, and how can we um, you know be prescriptive about what those best practices look like? So currently we we we're on version 0.1.2 of Ground. Um, we have initial community testing underway from from collaborators at Capital One and Hotels.com. Um, and we're really excited to, to get more use cases from people and start layering those on top of ground to understand um, wh where ground fits into to, you know, people's architectures more. Um, and we're really excited to get input and feedback and contributions and anything else that you guys are thinking. Um, in particular, we're, we're in the throes of thinking about what a query API looks like. And so we, we're really interested in figuring out what people want to get out of ground and, how, and what, the, um, what the desired use cases are. It's something we want to learn a little bit more about. For today, though, we, we have some goals as we're going through the exercises. The, the biggest goal is familiarizing you with the Common Ground API and model. Um, we want you guys to feel comfortable with, with how Ground works and thinks about the world. Um, we're going to walk you through a simple AI pipeline scenario as well, sort of in the vein of the pipeline management thing we were talking about a second ago. Um, and you guys are going to you know, see how things might change unexpectedly and then figure out how having Ground there to log things as you go will really help you debunk things more efficiently and more quickly. Um, and lastly, we're, um, last exercise is going to explore how you build applications that generate and exploit data context yourself. And you'll see that actually it's a pretty simple thing to do and, and um, it's something that we hope you're going to be doing more of in the near future. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I have for today. Um, the the bit.ly link in bold and italics is the feedback link for um, once you guys are done with the exercises. We'll put it up again at the end, don't worry. Um, we have a website, everything's on GitHub. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. It's an interesting question. That's not something that we've actively thought about so far. Um, one of, oh yeah, sorry. The question was any thoughts on a lint-like uh, processor that allows you to understand that if someone's changed the model below you, then how can we um, understand at higher layers that the model has changed? Um, yeah, that's not something that we've thought about actively. We've thought a little bit about change management and, and APIs for change propagation, um, but that's not something that we're actively working on now. But we do understand that that's a, that's a need and, and something that people want to think about. Yeah. And no SQL did? No, I haven't. Pachyderm's not a database. Pachyderm's a file system. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Oh. Interesting. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mike. <laughs> so, 
So if you um, look at some uh, legacy or prior applications from companies like Informatica, IBM, so forth, that we're looking at this problem in an enterprise space. Are you looking at, essentially this is an open source version, if you will, of those kinds of tools that could be also used in the en enterprise for warehousing, for uh, you know, uh, the data asset you talked about, lineage, and so on and so forth? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, we sort of think of ourselves as one abstraction level below systems like Informatica or um, things like Clutter and Navigator or, or um, Apache Atlas, which is Hortonworks um, tool in this space. We think that those are really valuable applications that help users think about one particular view of the world, in this case, uh, data analytics or Clutter as distribution of Hadoop. Um, but we think of ourselves as a system that could maybe layer underneath those systems and help unify data context from the, the analytics and infrastructure perspective, maybe also from other perspectives of people in an organization um, without having to you know, go, to the, go to one particular view that um, a tool like Navigator or Informatica would provide. But yes, we do, we do envision that this is something that could go into, a, um, into an enterprise. I mean, that, that data cataloging in enterprises is, is a use case that we, we want to pretty actively pursue. Can you get a mic there? Thank you. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, you haven't done a integration with Postgres. Right. So how do you fit uh, this in a data warehouse of concept where you want to track the versioning? Because this is... Track the what? Track the versioning of the previous uh, uh, models or maybe data when you store. So it's really hard uh, to go back and look at which model didn't perform and what are the mm -hmm. root cause. Yeah, so right now we built a versioning OR, we've hand-rolled a versioning ORM on top of Postgres ourselves. Um, so, so we've built... Uh, um, you know, the data model is on top of Postgres, it's versioned, it, and you would interact with ground, and then um, ground will, will <coughs> treat versioning natively and then translate that into Postgres speak. Um, so so you, would really, you wouldn't be interacting from the Postgres perspective, you'd be interacting from the ground perspective where you'd say, hey, first tell me what model was running in production on, you know, September 1st at 2 p.m. And then you say, okay, so now I know it was model version 7, ground, tell me everything about model version 7. And when you see everything about model version 7, you'll see, okay, it was trained on this version of the code, this version of the data. And then you can go look at those versions of the code and data respectively to understand maybe what went wrong and try to debug the, um, or maybe you could retrain the model yourself now, feed in the same prediction, walk, log things, and walk through the logic, right? So, so that's, that's sort of, um, that's actually a scenario that you're going you're gonna to see later today. So that, that's sort of how we, we envision um, that, that worsening and change aspect working. I also have a question. Um, so you mentioned about the versioning uh, of the objects as well as the edges, the nodes and the edges, right? Yeah. Um, so when the, uh, when the objects uh, is changed, uh, does the edge point to the old one or automatically point to the, the <laughs> same object? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so uh, the original design of our system actually would um, create a new edge version every time a new node version was created. As you can imagine, that create that could create a very large exponential number of edge versions as, as things get updated. Um, so the way things actually work right now is that our edges are version ranged on each side. So you provide a range of versions, a range of start node from node versions and a range of two node versions. So it, it ought, it, so you don't uh, create this like unnecessary propagation of, of objects in the system. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, over there on the, oh, thank you. So building upon on the same question itself, when the node splits or nodes gets combined, so how do you handle those ones when the edges gets deleted or new edges needs to be introduced in between the nodes as the new nodes gets created? Right now, we actually don't do anything in that case. We, um, we, uh, I don't think we have a good grasp on what the default semantics should be yet. So we're letting the user, um, we're, we're sort of washing our hands of that and, and waiting until we have a better idea of what the default behavior should be. But right now, it's up to the user to specify what they want to happen in those scenarios. Yeah. Because the tables usually get very often split, right? So when you have a data model mm -hmm. in a relational database, so you can take a table, you split it into two tables. So you need to handle that one. 
previous version had a one table with 20 columns. Yep. Now you have a two tables with the 10 columns each. So what do you do with the um, new foreign key constraint in between that? Yeah, so I mean, what we would probably do right now is add like a tombstone to the old version of the table that said, hey, this table is no longer in use and then create two new nodes for the new version of the table. Because it's, in some ways, it's a completely new set of logical objects, right? You have, you had one and now you have two different things. So we'd actually probably separate them out um, is the like recommended way that we would do it right now, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How do you see this relating to storing statistics that you could use for uh, query planning and also for data quality checks? Yeah, so um, that's actually, uh, in terms of, of data quality monitoring, that's something that um, I think we're pretty interested in pursuing, right, Joe, before, yeah, before I say more words. That is something that we are very interested in pursuing um, as, we, as we move forward. Um, in terms of, of things like query planning and query execution, um, you know that that comes under the scope of what you would traditionally think of as a as a data catalog in a in a relational database, and so that's something that we are definitely um, amenable to. It's not something that we've done active work on, but it's something we definitely envision being in and a part of Ground. Cool. Um, so it's eleven thirty, so I think we should get started on the exercises. Um, so I'm told that everyone knows where to log in. Um, so if you guys go to the, the risecamp.tech website, um, you will see a ground directory. Within the ground directory, there will be a risecamp directory. Um, so if you go to the ground slash risecamp directory, you will find four notebooks there. The first notebook is, uh, is zero indexed. Um, and so ground zero is just gonna be an introduction. We recommend you walk through it just to get a more detailed understanding. I've alluded to some of this stuff, but it'll give you a more detailed understanding and overview of everything we're gonna be going through today. Um, the first exercise will walk you through a simple instrumented analytics scenario. And the second exercise will walk you through um, an AI pipeline scenario with some change management and, and some, break, some things that break and have you debug that. Um, there's, a, there's a fourth exercise as well, that one, um, is an advanced exercise where you're gonna build your own above ground application using some of the, the tools we've already built. Um, that, like I said, that's an advanced exercise. We think that the first, the first couple will keep you busy for the hour. Um, and for the next hour, myself and Rolando, if you can raise your hand, and Yifan in the back, if you can raise your hand, will be around to answer your questions and help you out. Um, we're gonna give you about 15 to 20 minutes to go through the first exercise and then we'll walk through it. Um, and then we'll give you another about half hour to do the second one and then walk through the solutions for that one as well to make sure everyone's on the same page. Okay, so I'm gonna take a couple minutes to, to go through the, the, the first set of exercises um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, feel free to jump in with questions anytime if there's something that's not clear, happy to answer things. Um, so so the, the goal of this first exercise was to go through a simple, instrumented, you know, dummy analytics scenario. Um, and so, so the key objects that we're gonna care about here are a Git repository where we're gonna have some code. Um, so we've built this simple above ground client called the ground Git client that goes, clones a repository and um, automatically publishes the commit information from that repository into ground. Um, you guys can go look at the code. Most of it is Git piping, um, but it's pretty, um, pretty straightforward, yeah. Right, um, so the reason, the reason that that's happening is um, not because of any particular reason that like that is a problem with ground, it's just like the way that the environment is set up inside Jupiter. Um, yeah, so, so that error is actually like, you can actually fix that error if you go to the bottom and you run this, this reset ground thing, um, it'll actually fix that error. Um, yeah, so, so the question was like, if you rerun that cell, it's like not idempotent and that's because of the way the environment's set up right now. Um, the ground server is actually running locally inside the Docker container on EC2, yeah. Um, so, so we've published, we, we see that this Git repository, you guys can go look at it, it has two commits. Uh, both, ground now knows about both of those commits. Um, as a simple exercise, we are going to go and retrieve that and we see that the, you know, the name of the repository is there um, and it's ID one, pretty, pretty simple. In this repository, um, we have a data set that's called data.txt, right now it's just um, like 500 rows of simple, you know, like an integer, a string, and an integer. And so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use another similar tool called the ground file client that's gonna go and tell ground about this new data set. 
And so what we see here is that, that the file client went and created a node called data.txt. And then it went and created a new version of that node. And the version of this node has ID 10. Um, and we see that there's a bunch of information here in the tags. There's the C time of the, of the data set file, or the data.txt file. There's the, there's the name, it's, you know, repo, dot, uh, repo slash data.txt. And then we also have the size of the file, which is um, 8276 bytes, right? So now ground knows about our data and ground knows about our code. So the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to go and run the code that's in the repository on the data in the repository. And, and the, the, um, the code we're running is this, this code called column splitter.py that's just going to take the, each, uh, each row in, in data.txt, split it up into three columns. The first is an int, the second is a string, the third is another integer. And we run it. Um, it takes a second and it says it successfully transformed data.txt. So now we're going to use all this stuff. We, we've gone through this like simple scenario. We had some code, we had some data, and then we ran the code on the data. And all, Ground has known about all this stuff from the beginning to the end. So we want to show you guys that Ground actually did know about everything from the beginning to the end. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to retrieve the um, exact data set that, or the exact node version that we just retrieved a second ago. And we see it looks exactly the same. It's repo slash data.txt, same size, same ID, so we know it's the same version. Now, the next thing what we want to do is we actually want to go investigate the lineage of this data set, right? So we want to find um, the lineage edge that connects this data set to the other data set that was created after column splitter ran. So there's this API that says get node version adjacent lineage, and we're going to get the adjacent lineage to node version 10 because that's the ID that we have here. And we get returned this ID 16. So we know that there's a lineage edge with a lineage edge version, excuse me, with ID 16 that is adjacent to, um, to node version 10. So we're going to look at that lineage edge version. And we see, note that there's a, there's a git commit here, dd432b, that's exactly the same as this commit right here. So ground knew that the latest version of the git repository was this commit with this commit hash right here. So it was able to go get that commit hash and associate it with the lineage, saying that, hey, you, this data set was transformed. Here's the lineage that shows it. And here's also a reference to the code that actually transformed that, right? Everyone with me so far? Great. The last thing that we're going to do now is we're going to retrieve the derived data set. So this is the data set that the lineage edge points to. The lineage edge says there was this old data set called data.txt. And now there's going to be a new data set that, that is pointed to by this lineage edge that was the result of running column splitter.py and transforming data.txt. So we see here that there is a from rich version ID, which is version 10, which is the same version we started with all along. And there's a to rich version ID that's version 13. So we're going to get version 13. And we see that there's a new version. Um, and there's a, there's a hidden tag here for you to find. Um, and this is the, the derived data set. Um, I, there's actually one more thing we can do to find out the name of this derived data set. We can, so we see that there's node ID 12 right there. Um, so we can get node 12 and, oh, oops, uh, sorry. We can get the node that is the, um, so what happens when you improv. Um, we can get the node that is the result of, which is split data.csv and we can see the information that it is node ID 12 um, and it's called split data.csv. Any questions about that? Cool. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because I wrote the exercises. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, under, I understand your question. Um, so that, that's that's um, something that we are are still working on in terms of like the right semantics for the query API. Um, and so, so sorry, so the question was, how did I infer the name of the data set from just looking at, at this? Um, and the answer is that there's no good way to do that right now. That's something that we're working on in terms of getting, getting the right set of query APIs sorted out so that um, based on the information that, that, that Ground actually returns to you, you're going to be able to um, write the right queries. So that's either going to look like swapping out this node ID here for the actual, the, the source key, which in this case is split data.csv, or adding the opposite API that allows you to retrieve a node from the, um, version or maybe both. Um, we just haven't quite sorted out all the kinks with that just yet. 
Okay, so in the remaining half hour, I'm going to give you guys about 20 minutes and change to work on the second exercise. Um, and then for the last five or 10 minutes, Rolando is going to walk you guys through um, how the, the second exercise, which is a little bit um, more freeform and a little bit uh, harder to, to get through. Okay, so uh, please raise your hand if you've already walked through the entire um, second notebook tutorial. Okay. All right, so let's go through it. So let me set this up. And uh, the use case here is we're going to Twitter and we're pulling a set of like 80,000 tweets for machine learning applications. And this is a, a toy example, so this is not something you would do in, in production. But we just want to see if we can predict the country of origin of the tweet. And so we're going to collect some data. Um, and it's going to go through a process of cleaning, and then we're going to train the model, and then we're going to test it. So this is going to be the tutorial API. Uh, I've already heard some comments about um, how these APIs maybe don't uh, work the way we expect them, and this is because they were built for the specific application. So in, in the first notebook, we had like the ground client, and then we would call GC dot uh, the method, and then here we're doing like tutorial dot um, X and Y. Also, uh, like diff data schema takes two different arguments, um, the original data node version and then the uh, subsequent data node version. So now that we have the Twitter data, we might want to take a look just to see what we're trying to predict. And we see the tweet text, the country code, and, and then, for example, the full country. So we're going to uh, train and test the model to get some prediction accuracy. And this is going again to go through uh, this entire process. This is through a make file. Just, okay, so there it is. So it has a 59% prediction accuracy, which seems a little low, but when we consider that it's 170 different classes and just a random guess over that uh, class phase would be about 0.06%. Uh, we can see that the model is definitely learning something. So now we're going to retrieve the uh, most recent node version. Show model version. Okay. So we have model version 25, and we're going to see the dependencies. Okay. And so again, we see that it's the model version 25. And it has data dependencies. And so here we can think of like a small triangular DAG where we have the, the model that depends on the code and the data. And each node has its own set of node versions. So let's explore the data node version in more detail. Okay, and so this is a schema. And as we saw in the data, we see that the code is just a two-character country code. The country is a full country name. We have the place, um, a label for whether it's training or not, and so on. So now we're going to like move forward about a, a week. And what we're trying to demonstrate here is that sometimes context changes in ways that are beyond our control. So it's possible that Twitter could have renamed the columns. Uh, it's possible that maybe another company colleague was experimenting with a shared database and uh, they thought that maybe if they used the full country name, um, they would be able to get better prediction accuracy. So they were experimenting with that and then they possibly forgot to change it back to the original schema. But 
we're also assuming that they're using an above ground API um, that records like who is using the data and then also what data changes they make. So we get a call or a text from a colleague that says that uh, our model that we had deployed for predicting the country of origin is, is performing much more poorly than before. And we come and check it out. Give it a second to load. Okay, yeah, and we can see that the prediction accuracy dropped to uh, 30, like 36%, which is about the same as you would get if you would always guess the most frequent class, in this case, the United States. So let's do some exploration. Let's see all the model versions. We know that we must have at least two, the one that we deployed originally and the one that we're testing now. So the first one was ID 25, and now there's ID 35. We want to see the uh, metadata, or, or the schema, show data schema, for the new one. Oh no, okay, so here I'm looking at the node version, uh, uh, sorry, for the model node version. And so the model has data dependencies. So first I need to get the model version. Show model dependencies, yeah. Thank you. Okay, and so we see that the model with node version 35 depends on the data with node version 33. Thank you. Okay, and so if we just eyeball it, it's gonna be difficult to see the change. So let's try to use our diff function. Perfect. And so we see that the last uh, data node version that we saw is 33. So that's gonna be the, the two node version that we're comparing. And then let's look at the source. Okay, so we see that this is what got changed. Uh, place got dropped. The country in the old schema used to be the country from which the tweet originated, and now it's a two-character country code. And we see that code used to be the two-character country code, and so it looks like the column names were swapped. And to confirm this hypothesis, we can look at the data specifically. Display. Yeah, and that's how we confirm it. So the code is now the country name. Um, and so to fix this, we are going to swap the columns around. Do a deep copy. write the file. And we confirm whether this uh, corrected it. This should restore it back to a prediction accuracy of 
Oh, sorry, yeah. Thank you. Okay, and while this is loading, are there any questions? Yes. Thank you. 